and uh, little opinion. So um, just just to tell you our experience and what we feel about the temple medieval joint and today about our photosynthesis. So first. I will be talking about the endurance of the temple medibular joint, um, then about the procedure, the mode of action, and then I decided to emphasize the use of artrosynthesis for two main conditions, which are joint pain and joint limited opening. Um, the, I, Although I really wanted to concentrate, so one hour will, we can come out with some understanding uh, after one hour. Then uh, I would like to discuss the contribution of imaging to the diagnosis and to the prognosis of arthrosynthesis. First of all, about the endurance. Um, we speak about uh, a joint that has really complex architecture, which means upper and lower compartment and right and left joint are working together in different directions. This is a very complex situation. In addition, it is the only joint that function around the clock, day and night because we use a lot, as you know, the oral cavity at night as well. The last point, which is particular to the temporomedibular joint is its location, right in the middle of everywhere, the brain, salivary gland, uh, ophthalmology, you know, is ENT part. So it is a very complex location that sometimes makes the diagnosis um, like uh, challenging. And when we look at such a complex situation, it is very surprising that this joint is durable and really can function for so many years without, even sometimes without any problem. This, uh, we do uh, every year, not in Corona times, but we have courses in Vienna, in Paris on cadavers. And I was always impressed that certainly the cadavers are very old. And it seemed to me that the cadaver we were operating was about nine, 90 years old lady. So in other words, she was functioning for 188, 400 hours. And look at her function. You see, this is a joint that has worked so many years. Look how young it looks and how really straightforward it works. This makes us really feel responsible to this joint that we don't destroy or did, we did not affect negatively this very special joint. So I like this picture. You see who is carrying who? So we really have to respect this joint and avoid as much as possible unreversible procedures. So what makes it endurance, like such, a, such an efficient joint? I did collect three phenomena, three points that I would like to emphasize. The first is efficient lubrication. Second is shock absorber. And third is remodeling potential. When we talk about remodeling, about um, lubrication, look at this joint. And this is like an only illustration, of course. But look, the yellow stuff is a lubrication material. So we understand that it is extremely important issue to have a good lubrication system. 
And as we say, that may function 90 years. We have found like that very limited research was done on synovial joint cation. And when we look like in the shop of, of oils that are produced for cars, it's amazing to see the difference. To the very, really the bottom line in joint, we have studied the temporomedibular joint lubrication. And the, we know that in the joint, there is hyaluronic acid, which as you all know, is not a lubricant. It has very good characteristic of the anti-inflammatory and space occupying, but it is not a lubricant. And lubricin, another material that we have in the joint, includes phospholipids. And we believe that phospholipids are the major lubricant in the synovial fluids. Actually, we've done a study on that, on friction reduction in human synovial joint of liposomes that we have created with the same, same liposome that we identified in the temporomandibular joint. And now it is in clinical study, and I think it's, it's an important product because it provides lubrication it, and it's toxic free and it's inert and it's not a med, it's not a medication. So it's really a very innocent product. The next uh, point is shock absorber. Shock absorber means that the joint on like in a car, you know, this part of a car that keeps the possibility of the car to absorb um, load Tempo in the any joint, but in the temporal medullar joint, we have the disc, we have the articular cartilage, we have the subcondyl bone, and of course, the synovial fluid. But interestingly, in studies that were done, it seems that the most important part that attenuated load is actually the bone. 30% of the load is attenuated by the bone itself. And when you think about it, both the cartilage, the articular cartilage, the disc, are all the time under load. So the bone is, when it's flexible, it keeps some of the load. And imagine this bone to become sclerotic it cannot support the disc anymore. It cannot support the articular cartilage anymore. So this part is very important to have a healthy bone in this um, joint. Look at this joint. You see the sclerot, the how sclerotic the bone become. Very difficult for such a joint to survive. The last uh, part, part we, you know, all of them are macro, macro part of the joint, uh, the remodeling potential. When we look at bone, as you see here, the plate, this is in a growing individual, the growth plate include the stem cells that are responsible on the bone growth. Typically, when the child or the individual finish its growth period, this disappear and all the stem cells are gone. In the temporomedibular joint, right here, we have the proliferative layer which includes stem cells that are there forever. They are active only at the, growing, at the growth period, but they're there and they can respond along the life. And we believe that these cells are responsible for a pathology such as condylar hyperplasia, 
but it also important for but it also important for remodeling in cases of osteoarthritis we know that in all joints the number of patients that have osteoarthritis in hip knees feet hands whatever increase with age however in the temporomandibular joint, degenerative joint disease, also arthritis, is actually reaches the peak at 40 and then it goes down. It is a different joint. It's, it's not at all like other synovial joint in its behavior and it's in its potential to rehabilitate. And we do have to remember it when we treat the temporal joint. So we have, as I said, efficient lubrication, shock absorber, remodeling potential. And what happened? How sometimes the joint is affected and has a problem. So we need to have control. We need to have continuous function and we need to have stable Occlusion. We've studied different aspect loading and of function, and it's exciting to see how important that the joint will have some loading, but not overloading, and how important function is for the survival of the joint. And actually, the function is like a pump for the joint. When we close and open the, the mouth, the joint, the pressure in the joint change negative to positive. And it functions really like a pump that produces, that get rid of the waste and allow like nutrition product and oxygen to come in. And the same about the muscles. So we should remember some doctors will give a patient a medication when he has limited mouth opening, like painkiller. But the painkiller but by itself doesn't help. You have to give a pain cute killer for enabling function. What heals the joint is a function, not the medication. We do have to remember it. So those three things, are very important for are very important for the survival of the joint. When do we have a problem? Oh, does it work? Right. Okay. I have something that something is a. Uh, I have something that is over here. Okay. So when we have overloading or immobilization or for some reason unstable occlusion of the different type, then it affects the lubrication, affects the potential of shock absorber, and it also affects the growth potential. And then we get Why doesn't it work? Then we get this function. I mean, this is really simplifying. I was really admiring the chapter four that you published uh, in a book, which really gives the whole information, which is really impressive. What I'm trying to do is really to simplify and look at the joint as a very simple apparatus and to try to help it survive um, uh, this way. So in, our, in other words, our purpose when we treat the joint is to control the to rehabilitate function and to watch the occlusion 
make sure that the patient doesn't have uh, premature contact, posterior bite collapse, or maybe an open bite due to joint perfusion. Every patient we check, we have to look at those things because we have to treat them more when we want the patient to really rehabilitate. How did we control the load? Very shortly, we've measured the pressure in the joint, in the temple here, there is a needle in the joint, and we connected it to pressure measurement, actually arteriolar, arteriolar pressure machine, and we could find what happened in the joint during function. And as I said before, we have the up and down, positive to negative, positive to negative, like a pump that is so important for survival of the joint. But then we wanted to see if we have really extreme pressure in the joint. How can we change or reduce the pressure or the load in the joint? Since we deal with the lever system, we know that the distance between the vector of the occlusal surface and the joint actually determine the load, how much the joint be loaded. So we decided that we shall try a very, very flat, simple appliance that will bring the vector of the occlusal forces backward. In other words, distance between the, the occlusal forces and the joint is now shorter. Look here, the resistance arm is this, and here it becomes shorter. And we have found that in the presence of this appliance, we reduce pressures we measure in the joint in 80%, which is a lot. So this is a typical appliance, very simple, very cheap, that we use for even like emergency for patients who are complaining of joint pain. You see, this is the change in the length of the arm. Though this is the way it looks. It may look differently, but the thing I want, that the patient will occlude only on the back teeth. You see, here is with appliance and without a reduction of 80% of intraocular pressure from 68, the mean of 68 to about eight. Here is the measurement of positive and negative pressure. And we see this is this bump is important for nutrition, waste removal, lubrication, and you know also mandibular growth. The movement and the negative pressure that takes place in the joint is a stimulus for bone growth. And we know that sometimes we have pathology, which is outside joint in children, a pathology that doesn't enable the joint to move. The joint is a healthy. This joint will not grow. A joint that does not move will not grow. Rehabilitate function, you know, there are so many uh, approaches of rehabilitation or physiotherapy. I just for two here. Here we make sure if we have a problem of occlusion, we use a fist to return the, to make the like after condylectomy when the patient lost and have open bite, we help him and they have very good result. Or for example, when a patient have deviation after condylectomy, he uses as a guide his two hands to make sure that the opening will be without deviation. This is, is very, after any situation, to make sure the movement is symmetric, especially of the children. Because if the movement will not be symmetric, the face will not be symmetric. Watch the occlusion. This is a very interesting topic, a separate, we can talk about it sometimes. 
very interesting to see what enormous examples of changes in occlusion in relation to the temporal mandibular joint. This, I brought you one which is not connected to the temporal mandibular joint, but they think it's a fascinating case. When you look at this case, she came from the United States. She was an East girl. She came from the United States with this open bite. And she said, they planned for her automatic surgery. And also since she had a displacement on uh, both sides, so she had a program of bilateral temporomandibular joint surgery and bi bi bimaxillary orthognatic surgery. Checked her and she had, you know, this is her arch. But then what happened? We realized that her appliance does not reach the wisdom teeth. And actually, what she had was over eruption of the wisdom teeth. And the minute we extract all the four, she is back to occlusion. And it was very easy to take care of her two joint. And here she is, OK, without any surgery. I like this case because I think it's a very good one. If you have any question in the middle, I'm ready to stop. OK? Hello? OK. Yeah. OK. OK. okay. <clears throat> About arthrosynthesis, the procedure and mode of action. Arthrosynthesis, I find, is a procedure that is really complete. It is not. We have in the literature quite a number of complication mentioned. But basically, if you do it properly, you you don't have complication. So when you think about a procedure that is complication free, I like it because I think we help nature and we don't fight nature. This was the beginning. The beginning was long ago that we've done arthroscopy in the United States and we treat closed lock by lavage and lysis. And here we find Bruce Sanders, Murakami, my, not myself, but with Dolwick and Davis, all had really high number of success rate in closed lock. Then I came home and I didn't have an arthroscope. And in Israel, until you get something, you cannot wait for six months. So I said, why don't I pretend I have an arthroscope and I'll do arthrosynthesis. And I simply, use the same spot of entrance of arthroscopy, but I use two needles instead of an arthroscopy. So first of all, we give prophylaxis of anti, we do give antibiotic and analgetics. Then very carefully clean the, very careful. I never had, God, God help me, infection of the joint. I had a referral once, but we have to make this sure that we prepare the area very well. Then we insert a 18 gauge needle with just one ML syringe into the superior compartment in the fossa region. Why one ML? Because sometimes you are not in the joint. You inject and you aspirate. You inject and you aspirate. You don't want the tissue to be swollen. If you have one ml syringe, you cannot do any damage. But if you have 10 ml syringe, then you introduce too much fluid into the joint. So I had to enter the joint. When I am in the joint, when I pump and I see that the fluid return, then I insert two or three ml of Fringer solution or saline into the joint. Then the second needle is really easy to introduce because the superior compartment is like expanded. What I would like uh, then uh, before, before I give you a very important hint, we introduce now, it is known that you don't have to introduce 
more than 100 ml, 120 ml, although there were a publication of 300 and 400. This is enough to really wash the joint well. But you don't press too much. You have to make sure that every fluid you introduce will come out. What I would like to really tell you, very easy to introduce a needle to the joint, not in an open mouth position, but in a contralateral movement. You see it in a patient, when you ask the patient to do contralateral movement, you really feel very well the fossa and you can introduce a needle very easily. What you see here is that I'm using more the palpation rather than the measurements of arthroscopy, but I always put the measurements as well. You'll see in a minute, but the measurements are only like help you, but it does not, it is not a complete key. The real key key is the palpation, especially when you have limited mouth opening. You really have to feel very, even little movement to know where the fossa is and how to enter. But remember, contralateral movement makes life easy. Uh, as to supplement, just now, an article that I, this is a secret, don't tell it anyone, but I did referee on their article on an evidence-based article. Their conclusion is that there is a lack of high quality evidence that gives you, it, that gives you a, con that none of the supplement was proved to be more efficient than photosynthesis alone. I mean, there is no one excellent study that show that. So remember, I personally, sometimes I add uh, steroids like Depomedrol. And actually one, one comment in the study is that steroids did help the patient two weeks after arthrosynthesis. But yeah, the bottom line was that there is no proof that any supplement will be better than arthrosynthesis by itself. And this, this is a study of Martin Doig and with my both of them are experts in temporomandibular joint. I, I will really, I like this product and I think in the future it may be good. So when we enter is, you remember, from here to here, 12 millimeter, 10, to the, to the lateral uh, part of the eye, and you go two millimeter and down, and here is the fossa, here is the eminence, and these are the, like, a general guide, but not an absolute, not an absolute guide. Okay. So, flush, okay. And here in cadaver, these are the two entrance points. But actually, don't worry if you use two needles here in the same place. Some patients are very delicate, and you don't want to anesthetize more than the auricular, and you don't want to irritate them because anesthesia of all this area needs more injection. Sometimes I use another needle in the same location and it's as good. So don't worry, you can use two needles in the region. Now, how does it work? And this is very important. First of all, it separates the articular surface. What does it mean? Sometimes, and you will see the cases, there is adherence, stickiness, and the surface of moving, difficult to move. So when you wash it and you, under pressure, you open the joint, just give it the space, give it the volume that it really is. So this is very important and this will help 
Oh, just a minute. In function. Second, after synthesis washes away inflammatory product, blood and degraded product. This is really goes back to the fantastic chapter four that speaks about the molecule that causes, that are part of the deterioration of the joint, that ultrasynthesis will wash them away. So it is very important, the part of getting rid of particle degraded product and inflammatory and also pain causing product. This also, when you wash away, it will also reduce the load on the joint. Because if you have a fusion in the joint, you have increased pressure, increased loading. If you don't, even if you don't eat anything, in, in a, when you have, have a fusion, you have extremely high load on the joint. By washing it alone, arthrosynthesis reduce the load on the joint. So eliminating the fusion is very important as for the reducing pain and reducing the load on the joint. And of course, if you want to aspirate or you want to do research or you want to introduce a medication, you can use easily arthrosynthesis because I don't think it's a good idea to inject any medication to an inflamed joint with all the product in it. I think any injection should be after washing the joint. Because for example, people introduce hyaluronic acid into inflamed joint immediately. After two seconds, hyaluronic acid degrade in the presence of free radicals hyaluronic acid immediately degraded. So you remember always, if you want to add any into the joint, always do it after you wash the joint. Now, when we think about arthrosynthesis just by itself, we just spoke about our purpose to control loading. Arthrosynthesis control intraarticular loading, rehabilitate function, Arthrosynthesis by itself can rehabilitate function. And watch the occlusion. If we have perfusion that causes open bite, for example, because the joint is really perfused, then we have ipsy open bite. When we wash it, immediately we repair the open bite. So arthrosynthesis by itself may repair malocclusion. However, remember, arthrosynthesis must be complemented by control of loading, by appliance, by diet, etc. Always should be accompanied by physiotherapy, usually after arthrosynthesis and not before. And of course, eliminate any occlusal disruption your bite collapse or premature contact, you cannot do arthrosynthesis without an appliance because after arthrosynthesis, the joint is empty. It doesn't have any lubrication. And if the patient will, will clench on a joint without lubrication, he'll be stuck. So always never do arthrosynthesis without I do it without an appliance that reduces the load, okay? So it means that we do have to do very important, very careful clinical examination to really see why the patient developed the problem. So we treat the cause, okay? If the patient has a tent, really pressure, emotional pressure, or he's got uh, some kind of habit or, or occlusal problem, you have to approach the really cause for the problem that the patient presented.
what type of main, uh, main complaint we see. We see joint pain, waveform noise, limited mouth opening, malocclusion, asymmetry. Those are the major complaints that the patient will come to your clinic. We don't have to talk about all of them. We can do it other times. But right now, we will talk about joint pain, limited mouth opening, and associated malocclusion. So arthrosynthesis for joint pain. I want to emphasize that before we talk about joint pain, we have to know how we diagnose joint pain. Right this week, well, I didn't, I wanted to bring the slide I didn't bring. A friend of mine asked me, please come in with me to the surgery. I told him, but I cannot go into surgery without knowing anything about the patient. So I told, uh, and I, the, the surgery will say, and I called the patient and I asked her, where do, please take a picture, where do you have pain? All the question with WhatsApp. And here I realized the patient has limited mouth opening, just pain, or temporomandibular joint pain. So what do we do in order to make sure we have the right diagnosis? First of all, if you are sure, no problem. But you can always use local anesthesia to anesthetize the recurrent nerve and eliminate the joint pain. And if the patient says, oh, yes, I feel much better, then you know the, the pain is in the joint. Okay? If the, joint, if the pain comes from another source, <coughs> then he will not be painful. Then selectively load the temporomandibular joint by contralateral biting, indicating the intracapsular source of pain. You do load testing. Load testing is really important for the patient to know that the joint is inflamed. If you don't success, if you are not successful, what I give the patient, I give them a piece of bread, the hard part, and I tell them, please chew and tell me when is it more painful when you eat on the same side of the painful joint or when you eat on the contralateral. So this is a very important way to find out whether the pain source is really in the joint itself. Now, the patient, another thing is when you force the opening, you ask the patient to point with one finger, where is the pain? So patient point at, at, at pain location with one finger upon forced opening. So you, you see, it, does it point on the TMJ or does it point on the muscle or does it point somewhere else? So this is one way to know what caused the limited mouth opening. But make sure you know none of this test by itself is not good enough. Every patient is like a puzzle. Puzzle that you collect the pieces and then slowly, slowly you build up the correct diagnosis. Diagnosis. You know which piece belong there, which piece does not belong there, and then you can sure that you have the right diagnosis. One test is never enough. So make sure you have a puzzle of pieces that you fill them up and get the full picture of the patient. If you want, at one point, we can also speak simply about examination of patient tem temporomandibular joint patient. Now the last is joint palpation. Unfortunately, this is a little bit inaccurate and see why this is very small. 
because the joint is here and half a centimeter from here is a masseter and half a centimeter to the other side is a lateral pterygoid. So you think you palpate the joint, but you may well palpate the muscles. So this is not always accurate. Maybe more accurate is to palpate the joint from the ear itself, intraauricular. So all this will help you to know that you have a joint pain, okay? These are three studies that we have done in our place. I don't present the literature because as I told you, I wanted to share with you our experience. So here is, I don't see something disturbed me. Okay, here we have anchor disc phenomena. Look how pain reduced from nine to one. Here we, here we have this displacement without reduction, not so good from eight to five. In osteoarthritis, pain reduction is from 11, I mean the maximum is 15, to 3.8. Different studies long ago. So just make sure atrosynthesis helps to reduce the level of pain in the temporomandibular joint. And here we have a study that was done uh, long ago by, I assume you, Eliav, Eli Eliav, which is now in the United States. And he has done really an objective study by finding out that pain threshold went up after of the auricular temporal autosynthesis. So objectively, you have pain reduction after autosynthesis. Now, autosynthesis for joint limited motion. Do you have any question by now? There, there are a few questions, Professor, but I think it's better to, to answer them at the end of your lecture. Okay, maybe I'll turn on because it's becoming just a second. See if I like it. Okay. Now, talk about a lim uh, joint limited motion. The light is a bit too strong. I'll turn on the light. Okay, so arthrosynthesis for temporomandibular joint limited mouth opening, I thought I will include two conditions. One is closed lock, and the second would be osteoarthritis. We shall start with closed lock. Now, when we talk about closed lock, we have two types. We have one type that is actually published in nine, one type is moderately limited mouth opening caused by this displacement without reduction. The other one is severely limited mouth opening caused, we call it anchor disc phenomena, but it has different names. So we shall start with moderate limited mouth opening as a result of uh, this displacement without reduction. Here we see that this displacement without reduction, the disc in this illustration is in front of the condyle, and here a pseudo disc is created. This condition causes some limitation, but not complete limitation. You see that in the presence of the disc, the condyle could slide, not completely, but let's say, I would say three, uh, let's say three quarter of the way or something like that. But it depends. At the beginning of this displacement without reduction, the limitation more than later on after, um, after using the joint in this condition. 
This is what you see here on the left is altrography. Only the old generation knows what altrography is. When you look, is a contrast media in the inferior compartment and contrast media in the superior compartment. And this is the way they diagnose the location of the disc. You see in front, this is a condyle. And you see the disc, which is in between, is actually, that's the way how we define the condition of this displacement without reduction. At that time, there were no MRI, no way to diagnose what really happened in the joint. And using autography helped those very, very talented people to understand the condition of clicking of this displacement with reduction, this displacement without reduction, displacement with reduction with intermittent blocking. So as we, there is some sliding. In this patient, we, the maximal mouth opening will be 30, 30, 40, depends on the original opening. So they will have some limitation, but not complete limitation. We want to synthesis to this patient. Therefore, is, you see improvement of about five, millimeter, which is important for the patient, but not at the beginning. Then they physiotherapy and they can bring it up to 40. But since the cause is this, I think arthrosynthesis cannot change the location of the disc. It can only enable more movement in the superior compartment and improve partially the opening. In these cases, I would do artosynthesis because if you don't want people surgery, this will help them. There is a difference between 30 to 36 or 37 millimeter opening, especially when you can increase it with fever. And pain also reduced by artrosynthesis in these cases not really so much. And the reason is that the pain many times is caused by the location of the posterior that needs time to be cut to this. And it's extremely painful for a while. So in this displacement without reduction, arthrosynthesis reduce somewhat the pain good enough to do it, and it improved the maximal mouth opening, but not perfect. Let's look at severe limited mouth opening. And the case, she's 16 years old, and she came with limited mouth with deviation to the right. You see, she opened 22. This after physiotherapy. She was more limited before. She doesn't have pain as long as she doesn't try to open. So there is no question, there is no inflammation. There is no, but there is severe limitation of the move in the movement of the joint. Now, when you try to open, force, when you force opening, the patient will point on the right temporomandibular joint. Of course, this would provide a the if it would have been a muscular cause, she will not point at the joint. She's got very good ipsilateral movement, but very limited contralateral movement. Very typical condition to limited movement of the right temporomandibular joint. And I'll tell you a story about this girl. But when you look here, this is closed mouth position. Everything is normal, look very nice. But in open mouth position, there is some rotation, but no sliding. The cord keeps the condyle from sliding. 
this I think like an MRI of this condition, you see that the, con that the condyle rotates under the disc, but the disc doesn't slide. Why doesn't it slide? There were kinds of presumption like vacuum effect, suction cup effect by Bruce Sanders, stuck disc phenomena by a friend from Spain. We've called it anchor disc phenomena. What is it? Now we go back, we'll see this and see what happened in our opinion in anchor disc phenomena. This is a normal joint with a normal lubrication. You see, there, but however, now he start clenching. Patient clench, he may disrupt the lubrication system. And if they, there is no lubrication between the disc and the fossa, the disc will be stuck and the movement will be just rotation under the disc. And I, I think I've shown this before, but you see, this is a glass on the table that I'm standing now. You see, in a glass, when we wet it a little bit, the glass will stuck here to the plate. And it can be very strong. And if you force it, you may break the plate. How do you separate them? Only when you wash them. When you wash the plate away from the glass, you will, you will have it again free. However, when you put also uh, sabons, you know, or a sabon, then of course they will not be stuck together. Adherence forces in the fossa and the fossa and the smooth snake disc. In other words, when you don't have lubrication, then the two surfaces may be may stuck to one. And here you see that I wrote this up with Etzion Itzhak, which is now a friend of mine. But he was, I'll show you, the father of He came in, girl, and he asked me, okay, please, what does she have? I told him, I don't know, I'm looking for the expert of lubrication to understand why, what happened, but why, how can I help her? And, and I know that I can help her, but I don't know why. I'm looking for expert on the field of lubrication and friction. So he said, you know, I am the one. I am a world expert in this situation. And his name was Etzion. Here, this one. So we end up writing this article together on anchor disk phenomena. So here we have it. It's a had to take courses in the Technical Institute in order to understand what really happens there. Um, we don't have enough time to explain, but you can read it. So in this case, we have done our two synthesis to this girl, to her, and immediately what happened? She opens normal city and normal lateral movement, normal ipsilateral movement, normal protrusion without deviation. So it's a totally pure mechanical condition in the joint. No really a situation of pain. Immediately she survived here before and after. We have to make sure since the disc is stuck, you don't do physiotherapy before arthrosynthesis, only after. Otherwise you disrupt the anatomy of the joint. Now we are into osteoarthritis. What time is it? You know the time? Wow, already an hour. Okay. Yeah, I, I continue. 
go on. Keep on going. Don't fall asleep. Oh no, we're not falling asleep yet. Okay. So, um, also on this. Again, you remember that I told you the difference between also arthritis of the temporal mandibular joint and other joint. I think it's a completely different one. First, before we had the stem cells around to help in remodeling, and then that the fact that the problem itself does not increase with age. It's not an aging problem, but a condition that we believe is caused by overloading ocean or some, um, some uh, I don't know how, any weak joints. So we know that the temporal mandibular joint, we always are, all our body, when we have asymptomatic osteoarthritis, the joint is in adaptation situation. However, when it fails to adapt, then we have symptomatic osteoarthritis. So remember, uh, that's the way I see it, that we have a condition that the temporal mandibular joint all, all the time is in a situation of adaptation to the need of the occlusion. You have implants, you have a new bridge, you have denture. The joint has always adapted to the changes. So, uh, oh, the, the problem is, so what I do believe is that when we treat temporomandibular joint osteoarthritis, we don't want to make it a young look looking joint. We want to bring the joint back to, to adaptation, okay? From failure to adaptation to adaptation. Okay, when we speak about osteoarthritis, that different, different complaints of the patient. Each patient is different, like clicking is clicking, limited mouth opening, uh, uh, nerve displacement or ADP, clear cuttings. But here, patient may come with joint pain, may come with limitation, joint noises, or occlusal changes, anterior open bite, ipsy or contralateral open bite, all kinds of changes. And also very different from one patient to another. Here she is a patient with localized pain. He is a patient that speaks about limited mouth opening, but you see the terrifying posterior bite collapse. And here, this is her opening. She has no pain. She's developing this limited mouth opening with the years. She doesn't have time to come. Many children she come in this condition, only limited mouth opening. And this girl has, after she had severe pain and we took care of her pain, but she's left with severe open bite, severe open bite due to bilateral condylar resorption. So our treatment approach, the four, is in order to only eliminate the symptoms and bring the joint back to the pain. Or if we think about this car that fell off the road, put the car bring it to the road and when it starts functioning normally it will take care of itself most of the time so our purpose is again to control the loading rehabilitate function and watch the occlusion like the patient we have seen with posterior bite collapse you, we don't treat it unless i mean you cannot in this limitation but in our mind, make sure that we really, really rehabilitate really her occlusion as part of the treatment. Otherwise, she will be collapsed again. This girl is a lawyer, international lawyer. She doesn't look unhappy because we cover her eye. Believe me, she was in severe pain with limited, severely limited mouth. Okay? For six weeks only. But 
we see her limited mouth opening to the right and okay movement to the left. And here she is with deviation to the, to the left. Here is really severely damaged. When you think about it, it's flat, it's sclerosis. I mean, you see, it's not a good, good uh, picture, but you see how terribly affected this joint is. But this joint is symptomatic for six weeks. This joint doesn't look like this for six weeks. It was like this for months, but asymptomatic. So again, we have a bad looking joint was asymptomatic, become, became symptomatic. Here she is. We decided to take care of all her risk factor. We did arthrosynthesis. Here she is immediately after arthrosynthesis under local anesthesia, okay? And immediate improved pattern movement, okay? And here she is six months later. Years later, I mean, I see her because she, she lives a she was never painful again. Some patient comes back, most of them, believe me, will be due to muscular pain. But if they come back, we can take care of them. But in our study, just to make sure, after arthrosynthesis, the joint didn't change. Remember that, okay? So in our study, we have done long ago already, 2013, 81% of patients with osteoarthritis respond to arthrosynthesis and respond to the, excuse me, just a moment, respond to the point that they didn't need surgery. However, 19 patients did not respond, which means that arthrosynthesis served as the diagnostic tool that we know that in these cases, if we don't find solution and they are still in pain, surgery will be the solution. Just a summary of this patient. You see pain reduced from 6.2 to 2.3. It's not perfect, not zero, but it's good, good enough for them to rehabilitate itself. Dysfunction from 7.3 to 2.2. Improvement, how they describe on VAS from one to 10, they say they improve 8.3. So this is a quite good improvement by such a same procedure. Maximal mouth opening improved from mean of 26.2 to 39.2. So this is a quite good solution for patients with osteoarthritis. And when you read the beautiful chapter, and you can get the picture here. You have like a wash out of those products that are studied and that they cause so much damage, but we know that we can wash them out and avoid their reproduction by unloading the joint, okay? Now, also arthritis, uh, uh, this is, um, of course, this is your chapter, which I think is excellent and deals really with much more serious aspect of osteoarthritis. I'm like really on the surface, but you should read it and really understand the different aspect of temporomandibular joint osteoarthritis. Now, we had a question that I was really interested in. How does osteoarthritis develop? Does it the cartilage and, and go to the bone? Or does it start, goes to the bone? I mean, that first of all, the destruction of the cartilage, and then the bone is destroyed, or maybe differently. Oh, maybe the bone becomes sclerosed, and then the cartilage is affected. So we did uh, a study 
For here you see a case that the conga looks fantastic, but it's bitten like that. So here, the disease I believe had from the cartilage and the damage went into the bone. However, let's look at this condition of bone. If it is affecting the cartilage, this is a picture like normal bone slowly becomes sclerosed. And by being sclerosed, it doesn't support the articular cartilage. So we did um, two studies that uh, you see that those joints is actually, we believe that might be, it starts in the sclerosing of the bone and goes into the joint space. We've done a study, I don't have time to speak widely, but there was a material that, um, that is called a uh, kind that we injected into the joint and we know it causes hemolysis with thrombosis. And that's what we want. We wanted to imitate situation of hypoxia by thrombosis. And here we have seen that in this case, we could create osteoarthritis like here, thrombosis here, and sclerosis of the bone. Here is a normal condyle of the mouse, and here is damage after thrombosis to the bone. Okay, but we had another study that I liked, and I'll let you very shortly. I hope you can understand it be very short. The first sign of inflammation in the joint is blood vessels on the surface, right? Normal. And this is the beginning of damage. So we thought, what causes this blood vessel proliferation? We decided that VGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, that increased permeability, increased intraarticular pressure, cause angiogen, and also uh, is associated with endochondral formation. Maybe it has a factor in the joint. So because hypoxia really cause production of vasotelia growth factor. We injected VGF into mouse knee. And what very shortly happened is, just a minute, it doesn't work. We found this. We looked at sub at tools of osteoarthritis, osteoarthrosis, subchondral bone sclerosis, and cartilage degeneration, degeneration. And so that first in the first week until the fourth week, the bone is sclerosed and degenerate degeneration started only later. So for us in hint that might be that osteoarthritis in some cases begin with sclerosis of the bone rises with rather than damage to the cartilage. So before you rehabilitate the cartilage by all, all kinds of implants, you know, to create, to stick cartilage formation, make sure the bone is not sclerosed like in this one. Now imaging that roses. My question was, if a patient comes in with a CT scan or if we take a CT scan, what does it mean to us when we do this in treatment? Very shortly, we ask two questions. Imaging correlate with symptoms. Like patient is extremely painful. Does it mean that his CT scan will look bad? Or if a patient doesn't have symptoms, does it mean that his CT scan will be excellent? 
Another question is, can imaging predict the outcome of artrosynthesis? If a patient come, comes in to the, our clinic and we see very, very bad looking, very, very bad looking joint, can we tell him, oh, I'm sorry, you are in very bad condition. I don't think artrosynthesis will help you. Can we make, can the CT scan or predict the result of artrosynthesis? In our study, we found that like all these kinds of imaging, there was no significant correlation between the severity of the CT image and the clinical sign and symptoms, and as well the response to autosis. In other words, there is no way a patient comes in and we plan to do autosynthesis that I can tell him, oh, you are a good candidate or you are a bad candidate. Will it help you? It will not help you. I don't know. I don't know if the artrosynthesis, I know in osteoarthritis, if, if really we'll win. We know that 10% win, but I cannot tell which one is the one that win. And this leads to one thing that, that imaging cannot be used as prognostic tool, but artrosynthesis, when fail becomes a diagnostic tool that leads safely to surgical intervention. Now, uh, before conclusion, I wanted to, to speak about one more thing. Do you use Wilkes classification? Do you know what I mean? Can you tell me? You know, in the United States, in temporomandibular joint osteoarthritis or damage to the joint, they use Wilkes classification. Do you use it? If not, then you tell me. Dr. Oyarzo, Dr. Hernandez. Probably not. Yeah, it's the Wilkes classification, yeah? yeah? It seems as if the Wilkes, Professor Nitzen. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to say that we have to be very careful. And I'll tell you why. Because Wilkes classification has clinical finding and radiological finding. And what happened? He says one, two, three, four, five. And he speaks about condition that deteriorate together, that the clinical finding detect together with the radiological one. And this not true. And what happened is that young physician in the United States, we says, okay, he's got Wilkes four to surgery. He goes Wilkes five, whatever, for surgery. The decision-making is very dangerous because it's on Wilkes classification, which is unfortunately wrong. He was very good for that time, but today you understand that this classification is misleading and we actually not use it. I thought about possibility of using such a classification, for example, um, using radiological finding one, two, three, four, five, clinical finding ABC, and you can say my classification is one C, or three A or five D, you understand? By this, you can really put trustable information about the patient. I hope I made myself clear. So just the conclusion now, <laughs> conclusion, arthrosynthesis might be implemented, remember, by, by control the loading function, and aware of the occlusion. If arthrosism is efficient, especially in joint pain, open lock, limited mouth opening. Its efficiency is unpredictable. When fails arthrosynthesis, it acts as diagnostic tool 
and is led, as I say, to really inquire with classification. It's simple, relatively cheap, harmless, under local anesthesia, modest skill, minimal equipment are needed. So I think it's recommended and thank you. This is my, one of my patients. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nitzan, for your excellent lecture. Um, before we start with the questions, uh, I want to take the opportunity to greet Dr. Luis Mercury from Chicago, who is present in this lecture, oh, and really? who will be presenting on Thursday. Um, do you have anything to say, Dr. Luis Mercury? Ah, he's here? Yeah, yeah, he's here. I don't know if... Maybe he fell asleep. Yeah, yeah, wait a bit. Okay. Dorit, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Right here. Congratulations on your lecture. You're a great lead in to my lecture on Thursday. Yes, I'm planning to be there. I'm planning to be there. Good. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave to be on a WebEx with my uh, research colleagues at Rush. Um, but I just wanted to say hello to you and congratulations on your lecture. It's a great lead in to my lecture. So uh, I, I hope to see you on Thursday and everyone else. And I apologize for having to leave early. Thank you. Bye-bye. No worries, Bye. Dr. Thank you. Um, Dr. Villanueva, Dr. Yarson, Dr. Hernandez, I don't know if you have something to say or ask to Dr. Anitzan. Yes. Thank you, Doris, for your presentation. Uh, I have a, I don't know, one or two questions related between them, between it. Uh, what is your opinion regarding the use of esteroids or hyaluronic acid in the ultrasynthesis, or you prefer only the saline solution? Uh, as I said, uh, I myself do not use hyaluronic because it has, uh, first of all, in the literature is not recommended. And second, it uh, it doesn't stay there long. It stay for half lifetime of hyaluronic acid is very short, so it doesn't stay there for long. I don't use hyaluronic acid. I do use sometimes in osteoarthritis a steroid, a steroid, steroid injection. Yep. Thank you. Also, it doesn't stay there for long, but according to the study of Doric. Uh, it helps the patient two weeks later, he says. Uh, excuse so me. Uh, I yes. would like to dig in a little bit on that question. But first of all, Professor Nissan, uh, thank you very much for sharing this very valuable knowledge, which is also very complete, uh, your presentation. Um, regarding these adjuvants and considering the role of low-grade inflammation and the pathogenesis of osteoarthritis. Um, you, you say something very interesting about the timing of when using the adjuvant. So could you deepen a little bit more on that? Because I think it's very interesting that if you, while they are the, while the joint is already inflamed, uh, and you put some stuff like hyaluronic acid, it's like what, uh, uh, cells and process will break it down and it's gonna be more inflammatory. Even. So that's why I'm very interested in what you said about the timing of using the coadjuvants. So if you could deepen it a little more. The timing, what, uh, like hyaluronic acid, we know that it becomes itself it becomes um, uh, free radicals. That's what we found. When you, hyaluronic acid protect actually the phospholipids. And when, when uh, free radicals, when there is inflammation, free radicals degraded immediately the hyaluronic acid. And we found that hyaluronic acid degrad degradants becomes free radicals themselves. It's very strange. 
but this is it. So I don't inject hyaluronic acid. But what did you say about the timing? I didn't um, follow you. Because there is um, hyaluronic acid, but there are also some other adjuvants like corticosteroids or PRP. Um, so I mean the timing uh, referring to the occasion in which to administer regarding the, the washout of the, of the joint. Ah, okay. First of all, I do not use any of them. I'm not PRP, I'm not hyaluronic acid, and sometimes steroids. Uh, and I show the slide of Dr. Dowick's study on, on uh, really, he collected all the articles on supplements used in uh, ultrasynthesis, and he found that none of the study was really pointing uh, care, I mean, that you can rely upon and say you can use this adjuvant for arthrosynthesis. His conclusion in his study that arthrosynthesis by itself is as good as using arthrosynthesis with the adjuvant. That's what he says in his, in his, uh, in his collected article. I mean, it was not his study. It was collecting, I can, I can show, I have the slide. Do you want to, to see it again? Anyhow, that was his conclusion. I myself do not use all these adjuvants because I believe they don't stay there for long. And I believe it is back to function with unloading. Like give the joint the good environment uh, for rehabilitation. Do you okay. accept this? What do you, th do you think? Dr. Hernandez? Uh, I'm, I'm very okay with the answer, so I think it's very clear. Thank you. What? Maybe. What do you think? What do I think? Do you th yeah. Um, I think uh, that it makes a little sense what you say, and I'm just wondering about this uh, role of low-grade inflammation in the pathogenesis of the disorder, um, but mostly as it is not an infectious disorder, but has uh, this mechanical uh, relationship. Inflammation is um, due to other causes, such as these uh, products of uh, extracellular matrix breakdown. So these products become something called in immunology uh, dams, which mean damage associated molecular patterns that engage inflammatory cells and starts this process of um, low-grade inflammation, which is chronic, and uh, inflammatory cells degrading the, further degrading the bone and the cartilage. So yes, I'm not sure whether these, uh, even steroids, which uh, are, uh, have a very good role for inf against inflammation, can be useful. I have uh, seen them a lot in the literature, not only for uh, TMG uh, osteoarthritis, but also knee osteoarthritis and others. But probably it's uh, enough with washing out the, the articulation, the joint, and also washing out these dumps, which uh, triggers the inflammatory response. What do you think causes the degradation of the intercellular matrix? Um, well, uh, there's a lot of causes of that because we have inflammatory cells and they start um, um, uh, secreting enzymes which degrade extracellular matrix like this matrix metalloproteinases. Uh, and also these cytokines, uh, which um, engage this predominantly 
uh, osteolytic immune responses, such as TH17 lymphocytes. Uh, so that all together um, starts degrading bone and cartilage metrics. And it seems that the um, synovial fibroblast have a very active role in that, um, in that process too. So the main question might be what is uh, sustaining this inflammatory response, what triggers the, the inflammatory response first, and also what is sustaining that. Um, so it might be mechanical uh, disruption. I, I, Osteocytes can act like, like mechanoreceptors and then can, they can uh, cross talk with inflammatory cells. And when they are overloaded, they uh, ask for inflammatory cells to start the processes and the loss of um, bone homeostasis. Maybe, uh, I don't know if someone can or wants to add something else to, to this. It's, it's complex because it's like the egg or the chicken. I don't know which starts first and if this inflammatory is going on. We, 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 have, we have had a study that shows actually that, that hyaluronic acid in the joint protect the, protect the phospholipids the, which are lubrication in the joint. On the other hand, we find that similarly, the intracellular protect the phospholipids in the cell membrane. And when you overload, the, the, this is a start that, and, and you make free radicals, the intracellular pro, uh, matrix degraded, and then phospholipids to immediately attack the, the cells, etc. I believe very much in overloading. I don't know why. Clinically, I'm more clinician than researcher. I see how overloading is really, really affecting the joint. Yeah, but you said it. So this overloading can cause ischemia, and ischemia leads to uh, oxidative stress, which once again, yeah. starts inflammatory process. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that, I mean, it's only one route, but something starts the whole complex situation. And I feel that people approach help these patients a lot. I'm not sure about other joints, but in this joint, you understand? Yeah, yeah. Jack, I would like to ask a question for Professor Nitzen. Go ahead, Dr. Yerso. Professor, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your experience of all these years. I will have two questions that are linked. The first one is, when atrocentizers fail, you speak to step forward to surgical interventions. Which kind of surgical interventions are, do you perform? That's a very good question, I think. First of all, uh, I will try again, maybe, to do autosynthesis. I don't go quickly to surgery, but I assume that the reason, let's say, osteoarthritis with mouth opening. I assume that the cause was not eliminated by washing. So the cause is still in the joint. And in many cases that I went into the joint, I found osteophyte or perforation or condition that could not be solved by autosynthesis. So I do minimally, I fix it. If I see really osteophytes, I try to soothe them. And if I see perforation, I try to suture it, perform partial meniscectomy, or even high, high shaving or high condylectomy to reduce the load on the joint. I really try to do minimum, but just to allow this joint to function again. But my, the reason for surgery is that I understand that the wash simply 
did not help. So I assume that there is some that causes the pain and limitation that is unwashable. You understand? Yeah, yeah. Is it of clear? course? It's clear for me, but I made that question because painful TMD have proved to be explained in a biopsychosocial social frame. Yeah. And have those research has told us that arthrosynthesis outcome can be predicted by psychosocial aspects. So of the patient to maybe anxiety, depression, catastrophizing on, on pain, on chronic pain. Yeah, of course. A, uh -huh. So to what extent do you believe that <laughs> clinicians should uh, make or assess that issues on the patient before stepping forward oh, to sure. surgical procedures? No, sure, you have to really consider of those causes. But in, in those cases, I collaborate with the, uh, with the oral medicine people, pain clinic, that we really work together. But in those cases, I get the joint, but usually they have severe also muscular pain or other pain that be taken care. So we work together on that. But the joint itself reacts very well to treatment because you use those mechanically to the joint, even if they are in emotional stress, etc. Let's say severe clencher, use an unloading appliance that will be protected, okay? Uh, is it clear or not? But for sure, you need the collaboration with the oral medicine uh, people to really reduce the and support those patients' emotional distress and emotional bad condition. Okay? Okay. But Cases, those cases are, are not joint. The main pain is mostly ex extra articular. Uh, do you think so? Mm -hmm. Thank you. What do you think? Um, I believe that, as Marcella told before, Dr. Hernandez, it's not always based on loading on TMJ, a tralgia, TMJ pain. Sometimes we have, not sometimes, many times, on chronic pain, we what have- is TM, What is TMD? What is TMD? Temporal mandibular disorders, sorry. Oh, right. Disorder, <laughs> you know, it's like, a, it's not really, you understand, it includes muscles, it includes a joint, right? When you say uh -huh. TMD. Speaking about solely temporal mandibular joint pain. You understand? Of course, what do you think? I understand. Solely on arthralgia or temporal mandibular joint pain, when you have chronic pain in the TMG, you also have a central neural, central neural system that's, that's activated and you have a, a plastic uh, how are you, um, procedures that are occurring in your, in your central brain that may lead the, the main outcome of the, the procedure. So after the atrocentesis or the, uh, the shaving, the high shaving, you may still have pain. So that's why yeah, I was- I'm very, to disturb you. I'm very, very careful in this patient. I rarely do surgery in this patient because you may really, really destroy their life. If they have these general pain and, you know, most of the time when you operate those patients, they deteriorate to unbearable conditions. So we try to treat their pain in reverse by reversible uh, treat. Not so if a patient is like that, I will not operate on him because I know 
he will be the con his condition will be worse. Mm -hmm. you agree with me? No, I agree. Um, I so want to many, begin. actually. Not so many that are so, yeah, that so, uh, you know, myofascial pain and that. But when, they, when we see them, we really try to support them in, in we can, but surgery. Thank you. Um, I'm, Dr. Nitz, I'm going to begin with the audience, the question from the audience. Yes, sir. Um, there are many, many questions. Dr. René Rojas from Chile. Uh, according to your presentation, occlusal changes have a real influence in the joint condition? Yeah. That's the question. I, yeah. I mean, there are mm -hmm. interrelationships. We give a separate lecture on that. How the temporal mandibular joint affects the occlusion. This is one topic. And then how the occlusion affects the temporal mandibular joint. It's very interesting, the interrelationship between them. The, the point is that the effect of the occlusion on the joint is mostly when there is a simply increased like changes in the level three system that is a state with, with more loading on the joint. This mm -hmm. is a separate topic but also very interesting how the temporal mandibular joint affect the occlusion. Very interesting. And we also have uh, acquired, I mean, when we have uh, malocclusion, which is developmental, you treat it by orthodontic or orthognatic surgery. But when you have acquired malocclusion, due to, for example, any problem in the joint, this is a, a totally different way to treat this patient. You understand? Malocclusion or asymmetry that are acquired are treated completely different than malocclusion and asymmetry, which are developmental. Am I, am I clear? I hope. Yeah, yeah. But in a separate topic. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Luis Dr. Dr. Luis Lobo. Yeah, my friend Dorit, what a pleasure to be able to talk to you always. I miss meetings, you, meeting you in Paris. What is your opinion on the use of growth factors in functional arthrosis? Who is, Mise? Who is it? Luis Lobo. Ah, Lobo. Hello. <laughs> a good friend. Uh, of growth factor. I mean, as a cause or peer, you mean as a treatment? Yeah, in functional arthrosis. Um, theoretically, it helps, but I don't see in reality. You mean to add to like as a supplement, he means? What does he mean? Maybe that the, you can repeat the question. Or Dr. Lowe, are, are you there? You can. Okay, I use uh, factors in hello. growth factors. Hello, how are you? Hello, uh, hello. I use sometimes in, in arthrosis, functional arthrosis, uh, factors of growing in for regeneration, for regeneration. Can you use that? PLP, you mean? All, you know, the preparation, PLP? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. And uh, I just spoke. You, you remember Dorwick? Mm -hmm. You remember Dorwick from Florida? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He has done a study and he couldn't find any um, correlation between the addition of PLP to better, better, better results of arthrosynthesis. That's what he, he says. I don't use PRP. Okay. Okay. I use yeah. simple, simple autosynthesis. How are you? Fine, fine. 
Work so much. <laughs> and stay in my house. <laughs> ah, so why do you have the mask? The... I put that. Yeah. I was in my office. Yeah, unfortunately. All but right. we have to be in Paris, right? Yeah, oh, okay. We're Maybe in next year. Paris. Maybe it's next year. Maybe next year. Bye-bye, Dorian. Thank you. Uh, another question, Dr. Nitsan. Um, Juan Carlos Rodriguez asks, do wisdom teeth influence in some way the temporal mandibular joint? I don't think so. No. Okay. Um, he also asks, what type of occlusal appliance you recommend? Um, I show a slide of the occlusal appliance I recommend. I, I believe it is, uh, which is physically changed the level three system. Shall we show it? I can show it. Shall we? I'll show it in a second. Yeah. Okay. Do mm -hmm. you see that? Okay. Here. Okay. You have to press the green button to share the, your screen. Can you see that? Uh, green no. button, which one? At the bottom of your screen. There's a, that says wow. share screen. Uh, again, share. Yes. 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 Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, our jaw function according to level three system. You know, we have level one, level two, level three. Level one is in the kindergarten, you know, the one that goes like that, the children plays. Lever, you know what lever is? That goes like that. Mm -hmm. And lever three system is a lever which um, the, this the musk, the, the jaw, the maxillary mandible are functioning uh, according to the rules of lever three system. So here is the appliance any appliance that will bring the occlusion, the occlusal forces back to the back. You see the patient's open bite in the presence of the appliance. He bindly on the molar. That's, he uses at night. He clench, he clench only the back teeth. And this is pivot. He, the, it, the load will not reach the joints. I hope it, is it clear? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's like that, you see? It's not exactly, but the point is that you see that the occlusion on the back teeth. And this in our experience, reduces the load by 80%, okay? This is full occlusion, and this is occlusion only, only on the back teeth. By reducing the, the, the distance between the occlusion vector to the joint, we reduce the load on the joint. And so also on this, um, the load test, you know what test is? Loading test? Mm -hmm. yeah. Professor Nitsen? You know? Yes. Yes. And how can you explain that model on a chronic class, skeletal class two occlusion with an open bite, a chronic open bite? Plus three occlusion. No, no, no. Uh, what happens with that model of, of loading, of TMJ loading, when a, when a person has an anterior open bite, a chronic anterior open bite. Anterior open bite originally or due to condylar resorption? No, 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 anterior open bite. Uh, a clinical case of a 27 female 
with uh, anterior open bite since her early 15. And she starts a TMG pain on her first TMG pain at 27 with an open bite. You should uh, use with in her uh, the same splint. Well, if you can send me, I can I can tell you. I have to say, it, but that, that that's a principle. Yeah, but you you'll see that um, that that is the way I do it, even in these cases. But are you sure her pain is in the joint? Yes. I, I am trying to I am trying to understand the model of the loading of the TMG loading because no. the, the, as, as Professor Hernandez told before there are other other things that we can assess or acknowledge on the TMG pain more than like what? loading like what like nociception like, what? like central nervous system like inflammation. Uh, um, and other things. Yeah, it is true, but how they affect the joint? This is the question. How does the central nervous system affect the joint? Which way? No, it's yeah. not the central, it's not the central, the central nervous system affecting the joint. Is the joint in the central nervous system? We have related uh, <laughs> headaches and orofacial pain with TMG, TMJ pain. So maybe there are people who suffer more pain just of their, as you, as you show us the Eli Eliad research, they have shown us that the, how people feel the pain sometimes is more important than loading the TMJ. But it causes pain, you mean, or they feel pain? Feel the how they, how do they experience pain? I um, but you mean that due to central nervous system changes, right? That's what right. you mean, like, like facial pain. You say like yeah. facial pain uh -huh. can be central. <clears throat> so, so, so it be the joint pain, right? No, I don't understand. Maybe you, maybe you, if you don't mind to repeat, I'll, I'll appreciate it. I'd love to understand. Oh, you will have to understand. Um, no, I was trying to understand the model of the loading and changing the the, the occlusal loading on the TMJ. That's that's all. Don't I, worry. Yeah, I want to the loading cause pain. The loading doesn't cause pain. The loading causes changes in the joint and the inflammatory cascade. You are, the pain is not caused by the loading. The loading is only the the reason that the joint cannot cope with too much load. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. And then, mm -hmm. and go like different, different, there's a lot of literature that explains how pudding affect the biology of the joint. Many studies. We studied only the hypoxia and the free radical formation, but Loading for normal joint will not cause any pain. Loading uh -huh. of, of inflamed joint will cause pain. But I think you need inflammation for loading to cause pain. And if the pain is central, then you don't have inflammation in the joint, or do you? No, but we can have TMG pain with a good occlusion? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, sorry, uh, just to be on time, I think we will uh, give the opportunity to a last question is Dr. Manolis Husakos. 
is asking about, thank you very much for your interesting lecture, Dr. Nitsan. I would like to ask in your, in your experience, the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in an inflamed, inflamed joint can replace the use of arthrosynthesis before infiltrating hyaluronic acid? I, I tend to not to do that because I, I said before that any supplement should be injected into the joint when the joint is clean. Like you wash it first and then and you very rarely I inject steroid to a joint without arthrosis. Arthrosynthesis is so simple. And I feel that the effect is much better if you first clean the joint by washing it and then add whatever you want. I don't believe in hyaluronic acid or even in steroid so much. But if I do inject, then not before arthrosynthesis. Okay. Thank you very much. The joint is in the capsula of the joint, then yes. But if the pain is in, intra articular, then I will use first arthrosynthesis. Okay? Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Nitsen. Again, I think everyone is very happy and we have a lot of uh, good messages and about this uh, outstanding uh, uh, conference that you give us today. So uh, maybe I will uh, give the some word to Jack or Freya to stay thank you, to follow Dr. this uh, the next step. Dr. Nitsen, thank you very much for your excellent lecture once again. Would like if anyone has question, maybe email, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. For example, the last question of uh, pain, central nervous system. I would like to really go into the depths of it and then speak about it more deeply. Ah, uh, these are lectures. Wow. Yeah, those are the uh, yeah. next lectures we're having this week or the following weeks. Yeah. You, are, you are invited to all of them. I will send you the, the link. Yeah, please. Thank you. So thank so, you very much, uh, Dr. Nitsan. I hope to see you again here or eventually in Santiago. And, thank you very much. And, and thank you for everything. Um, lo siguiente lo voy a decir en español. Los dejamos cordialmente invitados como en todas las sesiones a las siguientes charlas de extensión de la Universidad de Chile. Eh, mañana martes a las 7 de la tarde va a estar la doctora Loreto Castellón hablando de distracción osteogénica en el tratamiento de las dimorfosis faciales en los pacientes pediátricos. Como dijimos anteriormente, el doctor Luis Mercury el día jueves a las 13 horas de Chile eh, sobre la posición del disco y el desarrollo de, de desórdenes temporomandibulares. El doctor Chucrún, probablemente conocido por todos nosotros, el sábado junto al doctor Osvaldo Gaona, eh, van a estar hablando eh, del ex, el estrés oxidativo, el doctor Chucrún, de los factores de crecimiento, y el doctor Osvaldo Gaona, de la aplicación de la fibrina rica en plaquetas en nuestro territorio. Y ya en septiembre, el próximo jueves, el doctor Alonso Carrasco Labra, eh, sobre investigación clínica en cirugía maxilofacial. Para que estén atentos a las redes sociales y se puedan ir inscribiendo de manera oportuna. Dr. Nitsan, again, thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you again with any lecture you would like to give us. We will be in touch. It's fantastic that you have such a program. Yeah, thank you, yes. Also, I want to thank uh, the, the, our Chilean experts in the TMJ field. So thank you very much, Dr. Hernandez Villanueva Ayoyarso. Thank you, thank you It is really my joy to be with you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Dorit. Thank you all. And Marcela. Thank you, Dorit. Okay. Great talking today. Thank you. Bueno, gracias a todos los que asistieron y esperamos contar con eh, su participación en las siguientes charlas. Eh, que tengan un, muy buenas tardes. Good evening, Dr. Nitsen. Thank you very much.
Good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Ella, puedes dejar de compartir para salir más fácil. Gracias.